Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Leaders in Supply Chain podcast. I am your host, Radu Palamar, your Managing Director of Elkut Global. Delighted to have with us today a great guest. We have Emer Cunningham, who's joining us. She has been for many, many years within the realm of supply chain. She's currently the Vice President for Internal Medicine Global Supply Chain at Pfizer. Well, she's had a fantastic career, quite unique in some ways, in many ways, because she started from engineering, then operational excellence, manufacturing, now in supply chain across end-to-end supply chain. She has done many, many different products and projects, and I'm very delighted that we can spare a few minutes today. And thanks for joining us, Emir. No, thank you for the invitation, Radu. It's lovely to see you again. And uh, yeah, looking forward to the discussion. Super. And first and foremost, I wanted to start with yourself and, and maybe a little bit about your story, your career, Amir. I know that you started as an engineer, manufacturing, ops excellence. Maybe tell us a little bit about, you know, 25 years in two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> 25 years in two minutes, right? So, yeah, I am a chemical engineer from University College Dublin. So I'm actually based in Ireland, not the UK, but same time zone. So I, I'll let you away with it. Um, chemical engineer from University College Dublin. I joined Pfizer as a process engineer in our active pharmaceutical ingredient plant here in Cork 25 years ago. And I spent a number of years ago, a number of years in manufacturing that I moved into engineering or really maintenance. So I was a, I led the plant maintenance function in Rangaskiddy for a couple of years. And then I took a no, the first of what would be a number of secondments initially in business operations. And then, as you mentioned, I moved into operational excellence. So at that time, Pfizer was embarking on a journey of operational excellence. And we started with that effectiveness journey. So Six Sigma. So I became a Six Sigma black belt and I sort of led the transformation at a site um, in Lockbeg in Ireland. So that was the cultural change around making sure we did root cause analysis and um, looking at things like common cause variation. And then we started to move into the efficiency piece, so lean. So I became a lean master initially at the site, looking at efficiency, point efficiency. But then I moved into a regional role, looking at the connections. And I guess that was the start of moving to supply chain. When you start to look at efficiencies and you try to link you know, manufacturing in one side to the next, you start to see what the supply chain looks like. And that was a, it was a great experience because I got to do a lot of technology. So I had started in API, but now I did drug product, I did packaging, I spent a little bit of time in sterile injectables. So it gave me that kind of broad view of the industry. And we then started to look at end-to-end -end supply chains. So we started to put together these value stream maps of what a pharmaceutical product looks like from start to end. And I think the piece for me at that point that was missing was the connection to the customer because we didn't really have a connection into commercial. We were doing this within manufacturing and supply. So I had an opportunity to move into supply chain initially within quite a tactical role as a, what we would call a brand supply leader and then into product portfolio management. And that was really the end to end and the product portfolio lead would face into commercial. So yeah, 25 years, lots of, of different experiences, but I guess all sort of moving in, in one direction and more realization as I traveled that supply chain is the full picture, right? It's that holistic view of you know, what we make, what the customer wants and how we put them together. Well, the analogy that, that I like the most and I found it, I'm, I'm a simple, you know, I, I, I didn't come from your background. I'm not an engineer by design. John Gatorna wrote the first book that I read eight, 10 years ago once I ended up doing consulting in supply chain uh, was his book. And, and he says that supply chain is the nervous system of the organization because it kind of enables all the different parts of the yeah. organization to move. So I like your your analogy as well. And I want to bring it also, what is, are you currently, so just also to preempt <laughs> anybody asking you about vaccines and so you're doing <laughs> so on the internal medicine. Yeah. <laughs> so my, my team is the internal medicine global supply chain team. And we are the team that sit between manufacturing and commercial. So we face into commercial and we sit with them and understand what their strategic direction for the products are. And then we turn around and we face into Pfizer Global Supply and say, well, what does a supply chain to deliver that vision look like? How do we put it together? What sites are involved? What's the logistics that's associated? And then we work very closely with our regional colleagues, colleagues in the markets, colleagues in the plants to actually deliver that. So internal medicine is the business unit in Pfizer that 
looks at some of those conditions that affect millions of people. So we have a broad women's health portfolio. We do cardiovascular, pain, CNS. So it's about 400 brands, about 9,000 SKUs that we, we globally orchestrate across the world. So it's good on the vaccine. I mean, we're so Pfizer proud of, of the vaccine. Um, but if anybody has any detailed questions on it, that's really, it, it's not my space. I mean, we're all so proud of it and we're all supporting it. But obviously we've got a team that are, are specifically dedicated to looking at it. Thanks for that clarification, because I'm pretty sure there, there might be. Um, so, and, and I want to, I just want to build a little bit on what you shared, because it is often that in the work that we do, we come across this disconnect where, and I liked your trajectory in your career, right? So you're engineering, manufacturing, but then there's a gap in a lot of organizations because it operate, they operate in silos where well, you don't really think of the customer. <laughs> you know, you're very focused in, oh, I'm designing the best product, not necessarily asking, does this product actually help my client? Does the client actually yeah. see that, right? I like how your organization is structured. It's kind of like the link bridging that, you know, commercial versus, you know, the, the, the people that actually make the product, right? So tell us a little bit, maybe how did you, why did Pfizer, I mean, it may seem obvious why they, they structured it like this, right? But tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, and, and I mean, it, it certainly was an evolution, right? We didn't, I don't think we immediately said this is the gap, right? But like many organizations, we're an asset-based organization within manufacturing and supply, right? We've got a, a network of sites, both internal and, and, and external, and we run those sites in ways that are efficient and effective and deliver quality product. But we recognize that sometimes we're delivering them in a way that the customer doesn't necessarily want or need, right? Whether that's in terms of the proliferation of different presentations or it's the cost that we're delivering. So we had been doing this end to end value stream mapping. We had been looking at lead time, trying to determine the link between lead time and inventory. And, and it came through again and again and again through that sort of lean philosophy that unless you really know what the customer wants, you're not necessarily delivering what they need. So we recognize that there was a gap to, to fill for people to sit in commercial. And I'm sure it's the same in many industries, very often manufacturing and commercial people. We speak different languages, right? We say things in different ways and we don't always understand each other. So what we're trying to do is make sure that we have translators in the middle that are sitting and understanding margin, market trends, you know, what an LOE really means for a product why we need 50 different presentations of the same tablet and then turning around and explaining that to manufacturing. So it, it became a journey as we had gone through it. And now we have it in place for all of our business units. We have what we call product portfolio leaders who are responsible for long term supply chain design. So they look at long range volume forecasting, they do capacity analysis and they're responsible for that supply chain design. And then we have brand supply leaders who are responsible for the execution of that. So they work with the sites on shorter term demand. They work, work really closely with our markets, our above market planners to make sure that, you know, inventory is in the right place, that we've looked at forecasting. So, yeah, it was a journey and I think we're still on it, right? And sometimes we don't always translate correctly and we still don't get it right. But it, but it has been, I think, an evolution in our organization that we see adds a lot of value to our supply chains. I like your positive frame when you say that some sales don't speak the same language as manufacturing. <laughs> I, would, I would argue that most sales don't speak the same language as whether it's manufacturing or supply chain at large. We, we're literally, uh, as part of the next summit, that we're doing a summit in two weeks and we're literally putting together storytelling. Storytelling meaning communication, influencing, mm -hmm. how do you convey a message training because it's a big disconnect. And then usually, and actually I want to ask you, right, because you came from that engineering background and Engineers tend to be practical, right? Get stuff yeah. done. Look, I mean, that many trucks are on the road. You were utilizing this much. Production is up by that. Da, 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 da. Sales, on the other hand, are like, well, oh, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm managing to sell more. My percentage is up. I'm managing to serve more clients. It's a different language, right? Yeah. So that's the, so I guess my question to you, because you came from the engineering world, right? And now you're kind of bridging the gap. What did you have to adapt for yourself, right? So when you, if you're to reflect back and think back, what were some of the things that you had to pick up and maybe the light bulb moments, right, in your career when you made this shift into your yeah. new role? It's a great question. And, you know, something I've, I guess I've reflected on over the years. I think in, in manufacturing and supply chain, you're right, we tend to be quite engineering, well, data focused, I would say, not even engineering, 
not sure I was a particularly good engineer, but you know, I you know, I think we think we're quite data focused, where we like a lot of facts. So when we're explaining things, we start with here's the problem, here are all the things that show me the problem, here are all the things that I did to find a resolution. Whereas when we're turning around and speaking with commercial, in my experience, they just want the bottom line up front. What does it mean? Tell it to me in one picture or one line. And that's a skill that I, I think we've had to learn over the years is we can't take all of the facts and figures and data that we as engineers and scientists would like to explain to you. We would like to explain to you the detail, whereas in actual fact, all we really need to tell you is the bottom line. What does it mean? And, and why is it good or why is it bad? Um, and that's taken years, I think, and I'm still not there. You know, I, and I work a lot with my team to say, if you're taking that deck to commercial, you've got to cut it from 16 <laughs> slides. It needs to be two and it needs to look good and deliver the message succinctly. And then capture them within about 20 to 30 seconds because, yeah. I mean, they, they tend to be ADHD. I mean, we all live in an ADHD world, but, you know, it's... <laughs> And, yeah, and maybe some more to be fair, Reju, I'm a little bit more probably to that direction myself than some of my other engineering colleagues. Me too. Maybe that's why I, <laughs> maybe that's why I, I fit better in that world. <laughs> Maybe let's talk also some examples and case studies. And, and I know I asked you to kind of think yeah. through some of the, the things that you have uh, have been most proud and lessons learned as well, challenges, you know, some of the things that you've done across Pfizer supply chain and with your teams. And maybe you can give us some concrete examples as well. Yeah, you know, when you look back, I think there's lots of things that you, you could pull out. But I suppose specifically within the team and the function that I'm in now, we're, we're relatively new, right? So we're about two and a half years in Pfizer when we made some of these changes to match to the business units and the, the big challenge for us as a supply chain organization is the complexity of the portfolio so we have these you know 400 products 9,000 SKUs. you know not every supply chain can be the same so how do you look at those supply chains and design for the future and so over the last two and a half years we've spent a lot of time on first of all segmenting so at a SKU level how do we deliver to the customer because not every SKU is the same. So we have medically necessary that we would deliver in one way. You know, we have something that might be more in a genericized portfolio that we would deliver in a different way. And then also looking at what we would call categorization. So, you know, products that are strategically important that we're going to invest in for the future, products that we actively manage. So we'll invest to, to maintain them. And then products that we maintain by exception because they are, you know, they, they may be running very smoothly, they don't need a lot of intervention, the demand is flash, you know, we put them on analytics and, and we run them. So running that process continually with commercial to say, do we all agree? Are we all aligned? These products are priority growth. These products are maintained by exception. Do we all understand what that means and designing supply chains for the future? So it's been, it's a cultural change, right? Because we can say this product is maintained by exception and at a global level, it is. But in an individual market, that product could be very important to that market because of their patient population or, or how things are dispersed. So we, we've got to work not just globally, but also locally to explain that doesn't mean supply chain performance is going to change. It's not like we're not planning to deliver you your product. It's how we manage it and how we invest for the future. So I, I would say we're still on that journey. And, and where it's been really important is that commercial partnership, because when we communicate, we communicate as commercial and supply chain together. So I don't communicate to a market, you know, your product is a priority growth or maintained by exception. We do that hand in hand with commercial. And that's been quite successful in terms of allowing us to focus where it, you know, our resources where it really matters because we can't have the same level of, um, of resourcing on 400 products. So that, that's been a process we've put in place and, and I think it's worked well for us and i think it's a it's a sea change in the way that we've looked at our supply chains mm. and if if i if i want to ask you to reflect on you know what was the 10 usually this this change management project this they boil down to a few very important things that when you do that right you know it 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 kind of works and if you don't do that right then nothing yeah. so if you, you if you had to think right in retrospect what mattered most right to to get this it's still work in progress but you know to get it yeah. through yeah. to to do this change management and i mean i think it links a little bit probably to, to the second piece i was going to talk about too but it is actually where we focused a lot on on data right so increasing our digitization and our analytics so the ability to say 
this is a lens that we're looking at within the commercial arena. So that's margin, it's patient need, so medically necessary, medically significant, and, and that's data driven. But then also on the supply side to say, we're looking at a lens of reliability, supply chain performance, capability, and being able to, to pull that data together and to put it in a way, I get back to our earlier conversation, that makes sense, that people can look at it and it's okay, yeah, so this percentage of our pro of our products are sit in this category because they fit these criteria and we've all agreed upfront what the criteria are. But you need the data to be able to do that. And that's been a sea change, right? How we have data availability and how we're using it for analytics. And okay, we have a couple of questions. I'll, I'll pull one. Let, let's see if we can decipher it, right? So An just, easy one to start. <laughs> uh, yes, Eric, I don't know if it's easy. <laughs> Because you talked about data, right? So, and ultimately, you know, everybody exists for the customer, right? So, uh, Sarika is asking, how do you basically look, or what are the things that you look after, right, to make sure that you are well? I, I guess retention is one. And hopefully, there's growth as well, right? Maybe yeah. the second part of this question. Yeah. So, in some ways, where we start is actually who is the customer, because the customer can be differentiated depending on those supply chains. So, for some products, we will have a very specific patient population. We can identify them. You know, we know who their HCPs might be, their healthcare professionals. We've got a lot of information from commercial. So, so who are they and, and what do they need? And, and we're looking at data that then specific to their needs. So demand, what the long range forecast looks like, you know, what, what, where, where the cost point is for those patients. On the other side, it may be just numbers right so so what's the actual demand look like and how do we deliver that so i i think it's not necessarily an analysis it is actually back to that very key question who is the customer and what are we delivering to them and then you set the parameters by which you do your analysis because the lens will be different depending on who the customer is and in recent times well recent i don't know if it's recent well 12 14 months, I guess, we've had the pandemic, we still have it. We've had major disruptions across the board from Suez Canal to strikes to factories being shut down to semiconductors to, I mean, I'll stop there because the, the, the list goes on and on and on and on, right? So, and it seems that I was reading, I think that that didn't affect much, but there's also a volcano that erupted again in Iceland pretty significantly. Yeah. So I hope not. So um, so I guess what's keeping you up at night, right? I mean, you have all these things that seem to be the new norm, right? That there's going to be a disruption. I mean, not every week, but quite often. So, so from, your, from where you sit, right? Uh, what's top of mind? Yeah, so, so I, like, I think we look back over the last 15 months and there's a couple of things actually that, that probably helped me sleep as well as the ones that keep me up at night. I think we saw the fruition of some of the work that we had been doing to make sure that we had done appropriate risk assessment and mitigation across supply chains. So, I mean, we've had huge disruption and not just at, at, at supply chain level, but at the patient level. I mean, for us in the business that I'm in, when patients don't go to the doctor, they don't get prescribed prescriptions. So now your forecast is volatile because then when they do go, instead of a doctor giving them a prescription for a month, he may give them the prescription for six months because he or she doesn't want them traveling during pandemic. So your, your, you know, your forecast becomes much more volatile in some of those products. So we've had that huge disruption, but, but we have pivoted. And, you know, I think we're all really proud of not just the vaccine, but the fact that in this period, we have supplied our hundreds of millions of patients almost without disruption. Not completely right, but almost without disruption. And that's because we had mitigation plans in place. We were able to change transportation lanes. We had inventory that we were able to use to support that volatility. So for me, that has been you know, a justification of the work that we had been doing in previous years. And sometimes it's like buying insurance, you know, you buy it and you, you kind of feel you didn't get value for money because you never used it. But then when an accident happens, you have it. And I think that's been a validation of, of us saying for many years, it's really important that we plan for the future, that we look at, at risk mitigation. So that sort of helps me sleep a little bit to say we've been doing the right things. I don't think we're done on the risk assessment piece, right? Because I don't think any of us ever planned for a risk of, you know, 50% of, of a site population 
being unable to, to, to work, you know, how do you then prioritise under those circumstances? You know, that our global transportation lanes would completely overnight, you know, no passenger planes, that's a huge change. So how do we now design a risk mitigation plan and process that takes into account factors that we never imagined? And, and so that's the creative piece. We now need people to be creative in terms of the types of risks we may see into the future. So, so that kind of keeps me up because I, I don't think we ever think, thought we'd saw a pandemic and now we have. I think we're all like, OK, what's next and how do we plan for that? So, that, so that's one. And then I think for, for me, the other piece that we're really focused on and we've got to continue to work on is the data piece and being able to use data to predict better what's going to happen, not even for the big pandemics, but actually for the normal things. So, so where can we use to move to autonomous supply chain, autonomous planning, so that our people can focus on when the things go bump in the night because the normal things are running much more smoothly. So how do we move to using data to just analyze what happened in the past to being able to use it to predict what's gonna happen in the future and to take those decisions earlier? And I'll pull this question. Uh, Manuel is asking about SNOP now. Okay, SNOP is one recent times. Well, recent, it's not that recent, but integrated business planning has come of age, yeah. uh, if I can use that term. There's all sorts of different software providers that talk about cognitive autom automation, the cognitive automation, about all sorts of very smart systems. Maybe tell us a little bit about, about your view on this and, and do you use it? Is it useful way to go? Yeah, so, so I think probably like everybody, we use a combination of all processes because we are, you know, globally located. We've got, you know, operations <laughs> spread across the world. And we do, you know, starting at the very top level, we do executive SNOPs, which are, are at a very high level in terms of signaling to the business, you know, risks or opportunities that we see. You know, we do them at a brand level. So for those priority growth, actively managed brands, we do SNOPs. We do them at a market level. Um, but then we also use autonomous planning. We use analytics for those products that they're probably in that maintained by exception bucket that I, that I refer to that, that can run without a lot of intervention. So we don't necessarily bring those into SNOP because they don't need that level of attention. And we do have then within our organization a very structured way of monitoring performance and, and taking action. So we call it IMEX, which is Integrated Manufacturing Excellence. It's really an evolution of that sort of operational excellence journey we were on, where at the level that the work is occurring, we're looking for outliers taking action and then escalating to the next level. So, so running through that kind of tiered process of escalation, both functionally and then horizontally to, to make sure that we're communicating, um, which is a very long winded answer to say it depends, right? Because I think you have to design, design to, to the business need and the businesses are so different. I mean, I'm internal medicine, but, you know, we have a rare disease business. We have an oncology business and their customers and needs are different to mine. And so we, we do have to standardize where we can and we do put a lot of emphasis on that because otherwise I think you spend a lot of time recreating the same process in multiple different places. So we standardize where we can and then where we can't, you have to use a combination of all the tools that are available to you. And how do you, I guess this is a question that I've been asking a lot. Uh, I mean, all this technology, software, you know, you name it, basically it's, it's advancing so fast. I was talking recently with a number of renowned global professors within supply chain. They themselves cannot keep up with, with all that is happening. So I guess you as a practitioner, obviously you have a day job, right? You need to run a business, you need to run a team. How do you also keep abreast of all these technology changes and new things that come, come in? It's almost, uh, you know, it's almost uh, unreal how fast it can happen, right? Yeah. It is, and it's in some ways, I think it's unrealistic to expect that we're, we're all keeping up with it. I, I would say one benefit I have seen from the pandemic, if we can say it's a benefit, but, but actually some of the kind of conferences and opportunities that have gone online 
means that I've actually been able to pop in and out to see sessions where that would never have happened if those were live because you know you, you say okay I can't go for four days but now okay well I can join for two hours a day so so that's been for me that's been a great opportunity on the flip side for the pandemic I would I would have to say that I mean I love to read and I would have been a, a strong reader of articles and books I've, I've found it harder to concentrate in the last year so I do the podcast thing I do and I listen to that as I walk and then the other piece for us I think we've because <laughs> it clearly was a really good time to do this we're, we're working on what we call vision 2025 which is the vision for supply chain in Pfizer for the future so my peers and we have teams in our organization working on different strands of things like you know patient centricity what the supply chain of the prof profession of the future looks like and we're, we're kind of doing this project right across supply chain to examine those different strands and actually that's a brilliant way to get that information as part of our working day because we try to spend a little bit of time as a leadership team you know every week and a little bit more time every month as part of our leadership team meeting delving into some of those areas um and I mean, on the digital side of it, I, I love the data. I love the analytics. I'm not particularly brilliant at it. And so one of the things I really admire is I admire the people who can help with those visualizations, right? So when I say, actually, what I really want to see is, you know, I want to see if I increase volume, reduce margin, like what does that do to absorption? And some of the you know, some of our team can say, okay, yeah, we, we can do that, Emer, and they turn it around and give me back a visualization. And that's a skill, you know, I, I, I would love to have, but I'm lucky in that I can lean and, and pull from those who have it. Yeah, well, I mean, ultimately, that's the goal of the team to complement skills. Yeah. And then, yeah, I actually, now that you, you mentioned it, I, I realized that I'm just, I mean, I'm in discussions for one of your, uh, one of your colleagues, and, and I'm going to be speaking at one of these conferences. And I, I was actually very pleasantly surprised. Uh, and the topic is the supply chain executive of the future that they, sure. they want me to share on. I almost felt, oh, I, you know, I hope I have something relevant to say. But it's it's a great it's a great initiative in terms of internal sharing and and I think you know it's Pfizer it's a couple of other organizations that 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 have been doing this and again this online medium whilst of course it's been tough for all of us from a you know personal interaction but I think it does also create an environment which can facilitate sharing at this level so it's yeah kudos and and great great stuff great initiatives now on the topic of skills right so and, and people in, in in general in supply chain i i'd love also to get your input in terms of what do you see uh, and you mentioned data you mentioned analytics what do you see as i guess the superpowers that teams need to have i mean not necessarily each individual not all of us need to have it but what are some of the key skills whether it's hard or soft that supply chain teams need to stay relevant and on their toes yeah, I, I, I guess we are probably not hugely different from, from other teams, right? Probably some of the, the, the skills are going to be the same. You know, I think the last 15 months have shown us that that resilience and agility is, is key, you know, to be able to say, oh, OK, there are no flights. Let's figure out a different way and to be able to pivot. So, so that resilience and is, is really important, but only comes with experience, right? I don't think you can teach that, right? People, people learn that as they go through their career. I, I think one of the pieces that we haven't focused on enough and we do need to into the future is actually building supply chain professionals of the future. And, and you know, it, it, it varies globally in terms of where people come into supply chain how do they enter supply chain you know do they enter from college do they enter through the business and and if they're entering through the business i think it brings you know it certainly brings a level of holistic view but then they're starting on the back foot in terms of you know having some of those skills around sap and data and how do we how do we upskill people and then it is certainly for those of us that are from engineering and scientific backgrounds realizing that it's the people actually that is important and not necessarily the data so for all i've spoken about the data if we don't have the right people in the team you're not going to get what you need from all the wonderful data and i think like many companies we've suffered in the past from having an excess of data without the people to actually interpret what does that mean so it's all very well to have all of this data but if we don't have people with those analytical skills who can look at it and say this is what that means then then 
we're not making the progress that we need to make. So, you know, as we look at, at people leaders, that pivot, which I think has happened globally to a people leader is not necessarily the technical expert in their area, but is actually the best person to lead a team and to get the best out of those team members is, is something that we look for into the future. And then I think like everybody, we've got to focus on, on, on diversity and making sure that our supply chain teams reflect the communities that we serve. So that's both gender and race and sexual orientation, that, that supply chain teams need to be reflective of, of society. Um, and that's a work in progress, I would say, for everybody. And uh, I mean, most books mention the three three components of any successful business, right? Which tend to be people, process, technology, processes, technology. And to your to your point, I was on a different panel yesterday. One of the speakers made this uh, very clearly, just uh, kind of following what you just shared, is that typically companies focus a lot on processes and technology. <laughs> they don't really focus so as much or as much as they should on the people element, because ultimately. If you have the process, you have the technology, but people are not on board. Yeah. I'm not sure it's that relevant. So, yeah. um, and I think what we've seen, right, is that when the technology fails and the processes are disrupted, if we have the right people, we can still support the business. But if you don't have the people, the processes and the technology are not going to get your customer what they need. And I think the last 15 months have, have shown us that, you know, where processes that we've had in place for decades and which have served us well, all of a sudden we're no longer fit for purpose because the world environment had changed. So without having the right people in place, we, we wouldn't have been able to adapt those processes. So I, I absolutely agree with you. We all look at the three P's and, and to be honest, we would love to work on the process and technology because those are those are easier fixes, right? <laughs> those are those are technically we can do that, um, but we really need to focus on the people. Yeah, and and I, I'd like also to ask you, uh, you know, reflecting back on your on your career, what was some of the you know some of the most useful principles that you applied? Maybe if you were to to look back, one or two, you know, maybe for the younger audience, not necessarily younger as well, uh, mid level, right? What helped you the most in your career? Yeah, so it's funny, you know, look back and you. People say, did you have a plan? And of course the answer was no. I mean, I had no plan really. Um, and and I mean, I came out of college as a chemical engineer. I, I didn't envisage supply chain. I don't know that we ever even covered it in the curriculum. I mean, it, you know, I don't remember it being a thing. So, but I, I think what had served me well is that I, I just took opportunities. So as they came up, I said, yeah, actually that's interesting. I'm, I'm going to do that. So I, I took secondments because the work in and of itself was interesting. And then the curiosity of, oh, so this could lead to that. Right, well, then I'll, I'll try that. And then, I, I mean, I took quite a lot of lateral moves, right, to try to learn technologies, the business, and, and then into supply chain, because while I was fascinated by what supply chain delivered, I didn't really understand it until I worked, worked in it. So I think that curiosity and taking those opportunities and, and, you know, I probably didn't overthink it, to be honest, Radu. I probably just did some of it and said, oh, this looks good. Let's do this for a while. And and that has served me well. Look, I, I you know, I, I cannot stress how important not overthinking is. <laughs> and I think we as humans, we are almost geared. It's almost impossible. And and typically the not cases, the entrepreneurs, the, there's, there's certain profiles of people that tend not to think so much and then they they're very action focused and it tends to serve well because most of the times you know for example with social media just taking that as an example right i mean people ask us a lot oh how do you be, build a profile on social media and all of that well the simple answer is you post and you try to learn from your post and you you know do it again and then you post relevant to your audience and then you see what works and then you do it again but then they never actually get to the stage of actually posting because they think, oh, but this is not the, you know, I'm not inventing like Einstein, the next theory of relativity. Well, you, nobody's expecting you to, right? So if that's your standard, you're never going to do anything, right? So it, it applies in so many areas. So I love when you said that not overthinking because sometimes, yeah, you just need to plunge and then you figure out how to swim and yeah. it kind of works out, yeah. right? And, and also I think trying to predict is this step going to get to that step is, is that's a rabbit hole because you you can there's no answer to that question right all you can do is say well is the next step interesting would i 
like would I be good at that well yeah I'll, I'll do this next step and let's see where this step brings um whereas I, you can get sucked down into that rabbit hole of is this the right move to get to here and maybe others have better career planning than I have but that's certainly been my 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 process now I'll, I'll build on that with another example I was talking to a CEO and, and he was saying that he's in, you know he finds it uh, bewildering for himself when he has this high performers you know they want to and generation y millennials there's a lot being said that they want to promote to get promoted so fast and he was saying like rather they come to me oh yeah two three years i need to do i need to promote i need to get I'm like relax you know like first and foremost do what you're currently doing of course do a great job because you know i mean but why do you need to stress yourself already with the oh, you know you just started this job and you're already stressing with the next five steps like come on like you know also that the world is changing the organizations evolve right so course do a great job i mean if you don't deliver then unlikely that you're gonna That's a <laughs> focus on where you are yeah and today right i mean stop thinking so much in the future that is like okay so i mean who actually can predict who would have predicted COVID? who would have i mean obviously there's different types of personalities and there's people that are way more structured than others but in general i, I haven't come across too many that can read future the, the future uh, yeah. accurately <laughs> And, and I think it's a great point that the world is changing. I mean, if I look back over the last 15 years, I don't think any of the roles that I had existed before I had them, right? So that, that was part of a, of a restructure or a, a new program or something. So, you know, if, if you had said 15 years ago, oh, it's internal medicine supply chain, everybody would have looked to you and went, well, that doesn't exist. There, there isn't such an organization. So, so that's been a big learning for me because you say, well, you can plan all you like, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what's going to be there when you get there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, Emir, on that note, I want to thank you for your time. We've had quite a few other questions. I'll take you separately. You can answer some offline as well. It's been a okay. pleasure to have you. Thanks for the candid the candid sharing. I, I am going to pull before you, we go wrong here. Here you go. There's a compliments for being so original. So one of many good comments and and wishing you lots and lots of you know interesting excitements and fun and then keep up the great work at Pfizer. And thank you so much Raju and thanks everybody it was lovely to speak to you. Thank you for listening to our podcast. If you like what you heard be sure to go to www.elcotglobal.com and click the podcast button for all the show notes of the interview. Also subscribe to our mailing list to get our latest updates first. If you're listening through a streaming platform like iTunes, Spotify or Stitcher we would appreciate a kind review. Five star works best to keep us going and our production team happy. And of course, share it with your friends. I'm most active on LinkedIn, so do feel free to follow me. And if you have any suggestions on what, what to do and who to invite next, don't hesitate to drop me a note. And if you're looking to hire top executives in supply chain or transform your business, of course, contact us as well to find out how we can help.